Welcome to Around Town. I'm your host, Dick Patton. It's a pleasure to welcome you back. Here we are in spring, and April is on its way out, believe it or not. And May is knocking on the door, and of course, you know what that brings. Mother's Day and gra college graduations and ultimately Memorial Day. But with me today is my very special guest, Christopher Pappas who is the, uh, our executive counselor for, for the governor's uh, council from District 4. Mm -hmm. And um, also, he's the owner of the Purity in Back Room and on the Manchester Hookset line down there. And I enjoyed my meal tremendously Easter Sunday down there. And uh, he has the best lobster pie. I don't care. <laughs> you do. Good to be here once it's again. It's good to see yeah, you thanks again, for the invitation. Christopher. I'm telling you, it's so good to see you. You know, and I assume you're going to be Governor Pappas next year. No, no, <laughs> that's, that's not my intention. That's not why I'm coming on this show. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we have been busy at the State House, as you well know. Um, but you know, it's been a different kind of busy, at least yes. for us anyway. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, because the Senate has been kind of, I don't know, I'm just... The first few terms where I was used to coming in almost every week from January to June. Mm -hmm. We could plan on every Wednesday. Yep. Almost. This year we've hardly had a session. Hmm. I don't know where all the bills are. Well, you didn't do a budget. No, so, so no, that. that didn't go. Uh, there and that, yeah, and used to be we'd yeah. be doing that in June. Yeah. Well, I can only speak for what happens on our side of the state. I know. So I'll leave the legislating to you. Yeah. Uh, but the governor and council certainly have been busy. Yeah. Um, you know, Governor Sununu has a number of key appointments, um, that some that he's already made, some that he has yet to make. How do um, you get on to some of those things? Now, you, you talk sure. appointments. How does someone know what appointments are open? And then how does somebody get on one of those things? That's right. Sometimes it's, it's not a very transparent process, unfortunately. Mm, yeah. So I think some work needs to be done because, you know, the Secretary of State has a list, a red book, of all the boards and commissions, what slots are filled, what the terms are, what slots are, are open and have yet to be filled. Um, but it's not necessarily kept up in real time, so um, it's a little bit dated, uh, the information that you can find on the state mm. website. Okay. So I think we need to do a little bit better there. Um, but there are hundreds of appointments to professional boards and commissions where we're always looking for people who um, maybe are, uh, you, you know, serve in a certain capacity uh, in their job or in their community mm -hmm. and could lend their expertise to the state. There are lots of public member positions. So even if you're not an optometrist or, yeah. um, you know, you name it, um, you can be on one of these boards and contribute as a layperson, mm -hmm. um, as a member of the public. So um, I'm always asking for resumes and asking for people from my district if, if they're at all interested in giving back a little bit, either to their profession on one of these boards or just to the people of the state. Uh, we'd love to use your talents. We hear nothing from ours then. Our district has never, I've never heard anything from my district. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's uh, Andy Valinsky, is a yeah. new counselor yeah. from Concord. Yeah. Um, and he is, um, you know, I think doing a great job. He's getting up to speed pretty well. And one of his challenges is. You know, we've got these districts that don't keep together communities of interest. No. Right? So he's over in Dover. He's over in Keene. Oh, I know. Um, he's all over the state. Um, my district's a little bit more compact, so it's yeah. uh, loosely the greater Manchester area, but also part of the Concord area. Oh, yeah. You're uh, right. Too. So right I, I, get up, I gotta get up into this neck of the woods whenever I can. Because if I remember right, you have Loudon and Pembroke, don't you? Loudon, Pembroke, Bow, Bo, Allenstown, yeah. uh, Pittsfield, Chichester, yeah, Epsom. It, yeah. so, so lots of towns in Merrimack County, hooks it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm trying to do what I can to get out to the old home days and meet with the boards of selectmen. But yet he spread out the other way, then. Yeah, he spread out across the state. Why? Who, de who determines those districts? Well, there, there are state reps and state senators. We well, yeah. So in another four years, you'll have an opportunity after the new census comes out um, to redraw the lines. Really? And uh, my um, recommendation to you would be um, either do an independent redistricting commission that totally takes the political well, process out of it, yeah. um, or um, be sensible and keep together communities of interest. Oh, I know, because it doesn't seem, I, I don't understand it. Yeah. Because, you know, from Dover to Concord to Keene or wherever, it, it, I would think you'd have somebody in the western side, east side, you in the central, mm -hmm. 
up north because there's, yeah. there's five of you, right? There are five of us, yes. Yeah. Now, um, on the topic of appointments, uh, you know, I mentioned a uh, you know, number of board and commission appointments that we deal with, but there have been some significant ones that we've taken up already. Um, the governor nominated a new attorney general. Yeah. Um, he was someone who I didn't know, Gordon McDonald, but got acquainted with him through the process, mm. was very impressed. Um, and while you know, we come from different political parties, mm. he had the understanding that that office shouldn't be politicized. Yeah. He has a lot of integrity. I think he's going to be a good independent attorney general. Uh, he was um, indicated in the hearing that uh, you know, he could be as much of a problem uh, for the governor as anyone else because oh, good, he's going to be really fair and, and um, be true to upholding the law. And so I think he'll do a great job. So he was a 5-0 bipartisan mm. vote. Mm. We've had some others that are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, which I think continues to be problematic, is the new commissioner of education. Oh, um, yeah. You know, he is ideologically driven. Um, he's someone who um, had never been, really been in a public school in New Hampshire nope. before he nope. was nominated for the position. Um, and so I voted against him, um, as did Andy Valinsky, mm -hmm. the counselor from this district. Um, and we remain concerned um, that he's pushing an agenda as opposed to simply yeah. being an implementer, which is what he claimed um, he yeah. wanted to be initially. So that's one to watch. Well, wasn't he for a shot at school or something? Uh, he, he's, a, he's a, you know, certainly he homeschooled his seven kids, which is, mm. you know, wonderful. That's his choice. Yeah. Um, he's a big proponent of charter schools. He has supported legislation in the past um, to allow local districts to, um, you know, siphon money to private and parochial schools. Mm. Um, through the Croydon case, he was one of those um, anonymous donors that supported the yes, town of Croydon in that, that case. Um, and he's made some questionable moves since then. He's wanted to, you know, overhaul the science standards, even though the Board of Education just you know, did a deep dive and did that a couple of years ago. Um, so he really wants to remake education um, to fit his agenda, and I think that's pretty dangerous. Mm -hmm. Today there was news about um, the Board of Education, uh, which really is the policy-making uh, body within the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. um, and Tom Rathio, who serves as the chair, who I have a great deal of respect for, was oh. just notified by the governor today that he's not going to be reappointed. Um, and so I, I think, you know, that move, um, having Edelblut at uh, the Department of Education, and by the way, he's going to the legislature looking for increased powers um, and mm. to redefine his role in a way that strengthens his hand. Um, I think those are dangerous things for, um, you know, the way we do public education in our state. You know, New Hampshire schools are looked at as being among the best in the nation. Um, and I think we've seen a process over the last few years that has prioritized a personalized model of education. And I think we're in the process of implementing that. And I think, um, you know, going in a different direction or, you know, going the direction that this commission wants to take us in um, is really going to overturn a lot of bipartisan work that's gone on in the past. And he came very close to becoming governor, too. That's true. That's I mean, true. He didn't lose by much. Yeah. But somebody who really a lot of people didn't know. Yeah. And when you look at the other appointments this governor has on the horizon, um, he's got two appoint appointments to the state Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, a number of circuit court appointments. Yeah. Um, he's going to be nominating a new liquor commissioner. He's already nominated a new labor commissioner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Ken Merrifield, who's the mayor of Franklin. And we'll be taking a vote on him uh, on Wednesday of this week, tomorrow. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, so we'll see how that all shakes out. Uh, but the interesting thing about the system we have is that commissioners, um, and certainly executive counselors, don't serve at the pleasure of the governor. Um, there's a check and a balance here. And so, mm. you know, a commissioner can have a term for four or five years, depending on what the statute says. The governor has a term of two years. Um, so a lot of these nominees, you know, can potentially outlast the governor. Um, and the governor has to work with a lot of people that were put in by um, some of his predecessors. So it's an interesting system. And I think it helps spread out power. It helps make sure that we don't have one chief executive that um, mm. has too much authority and too much say. Yeah, I, and Russ, I know I had him on. He was, he was on my show right yeah. after he got inaugurated, and uh, I kidded with him a little bit. I, it was a light-hearted show. Next time I get him on, it'll be different. But mm -hmm. you know, I said to him, I I know how he feels about passenger rail, and I said, you know, I know that you don't like, but he does like the down easter because he rides it mm -hmm. because Maine pays for it. Mm -hmm. 
But I said, you know, what about the ha middle of New Hampshire? We, 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 you know, why not private public partnership or something? I, mm -hmm. I, why should we be penalized? Mm -hmm. But he doesn't want it. Absolutely, up here. it's too bad because yeah. I mean Nashua and Manchester desperately want it. Mm -hmm. So let them go. Let them do something. Why? Yeah. Why not? What would be the holdup for them to make their own deals? Yeah. Well, the state should be helping to facilitate that. And yeah. there's been a lot of work done at the New Hampshire Rail Transit Authority at our Department of Transportation to help lay the groundwork to make that a reality. Unfortunately, we've hit some political roadblocks, oh, including yes. yeah. you know losing a vote in the legislature last year that mm -hmm. would have um, done the engineering work that needed to be done. Yeah. And obviously having a governor that's not supportive is really a deal breaker uh, over the next two years. Yeah. So we hope to keep this issue alive. Um, it's something that really could be a game changer economically for New Hampshire. Um, people want different options for modes of transportation. Um, young people uh, certainly want rail transportation as an option. Um, and it could be really important for um, you know this part of the state where we could see increased job growth, um, you know we could see more high tech businesses mm -hmm. wanting to locate to New Hampshire. Um, it really would help create a more livable state, you know where we can attract the workers we need to attract. I mean the one problem we're facing in New Hampshire is that we're an aging population. Oh yeah, and that we're missing out on that young demographic. Mm. Um, so building a skilled workforce is incredibly important. Transportation is one small piece yeah. of the puzzle, but it could be a significant one. Education is obviously another one. And making sure that we work on those pipelines and create those partnerships between uh, businesses and, uh, you know, and the workforce is, is really critical. So one thing that, c that confuses me, and I have said this to me, and, and I don't care if they like it or not, Pan Am does nothing to promote rail. But do they own the tracks, or, or who owns the tracks? B and M still own them, or do who owns the tracks? Yeah, so you would need an agreement uh, with Pan Am, and I think uh, because they have, um, you know, a lot of the tracks that we're talking about here, and you would, the state would have to invest in improvements mm. on that line so that you could get the speeds mm -hmm. um, that would, um, you know, make it attractive to ride that's from Manchester to yeah. Concord to Boston. Yeah. You don't want to be going on a train yeah, that's going that's... 20 miles an hour. Exactly. You want to be able to get there in an efficient yeah. way, mm -hmm. um, you know, and if, you know, the studies show that, you know, you could potentially get an hour uh, from Nashua to Boston, a little over an hour from Manchester, yeah. maybe an hour and a half from yeah. Concord to Boston. And I think that would be, you know, workable for people. That would be attractive. Of course, the buses don't want the trains in here, obviously. Yeah. But they're not handicapped accessible either. Mm -hmm. I can't get onto a bus. I mean, I can in a way with my cane, but mm -hmm. it's not very difficult. Yeah. For someone to get on it, and and if you're totally handicapped and using have to use a scooter chair, wheelchair, you can't get on there. Mm. Now they said I had a representative from Epsom tell me back years ago. He says, "Oh well, they are handicapped. Well, show me one then." Uh, yes, if you go to Boston, Logan Airport, or to Detroit when I go to Ann Arbor, or whatever, yes, the car rental shuttle buses are handicapped. They can lower down, and so you can get on. Mm -hmm. But Concord Coach is not handicapped accessible. You can't get on that bus. Mm. So, you know, it's very difficult. That's but an issue. I'd, I'd like to look into that a little bit more. Um, I have not seen a bus yet, mm -hmm. even Peter Pan or Vermont Trailways or Vermont, whatever, was it Greyhound? Mm -hmm. I've never seen them buses mm -hmm. that handicapped people can get on. Yeah. So... But I think in the train, and, and everywhere else in the world, trains are like, wow. Mm -hmm. But this state is so against yeah. it. But the, you know, the Seacoast benefits from the Downeaster. That's right. Uh, we have Amtrak service that runs up uh, the Connecticut Claremont. River Valley. Claremont yeah. uh, is very excited about yeah, um, they have know, it. trying to push for increased service there. Yeah. So I think um, you know, making sure the middle of the state is served as well is important. And if I remember right, I think up in the northern sector, isn't it the St. Lawrence Railway, aren't they promoting passenger rail from Canada or from Vermont through to Portland, Maine? Yeah, there's some talk about that. I, I know there's, I know. you know, That's the state has, um, you know, done some work um, to make sure that the tracks are um, improved for freight service. Yeah. And so there's a lot of freight that uh, travels that railway, and obviously 
there's an economic impact uh, to that for the North Country. But I think, if I remember right, they want to include passenger rail mm -hmm. from up there to yeah. Portland, too. Yeah, and, you know, they, eventually, you know, a connection between Montreal and Boston would be okay. very exciting. Yes, it would. That obviously runs right through New Hampshire. Yeah, it doesn't make sense, Chris. Yeah. And then, of course, you get to the casino. Mm -hmm. I know we've got a bill coming into the house. I don't think it's this week, but coming in soon from mm -hmm. the Senate about the casino thing again. Sure. And yeah, this is an issue again where, you know, the people of New Hampshire generally support um, expanded gaming. Um, public, uh, you know, elected officials don't, haven't supported it in the past. I'm not sure that'll change this time. Maybe you have a better read on where the house is. Well, I mean, the thing of it is what gets my goat is that they want Keno. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another one. Yeah. You know, we got bingo. If you have Keno, mm -hmm. then you get these scratch tickets from a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, twenty-five dollars. Mm -hmm. They say our casinos are addicted. What the heck are these other ones? Mm -hmm. And I have to say, sometimes I can get addicted to these scratch tickets. I like scratch tickets. And then you've got Mega Bucks, Powerball, Easy um, Daily Numbers. You know, it doesn't Mega Bucks. It doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. So what in the world is they call that? That's gambling to me. Sure, there's quite a bit out there. Certainly, the charitable the charitable casinos that exist in New Hampshire are, you know, the, the, that's I've casino never, gambling. I've state. never been to one of them. I, what, I don't even know what those are. I've never been to one. Sure, they have table games. Uh, there's poker. Oh really? Um, you know, so you can go in and bet uh, like you would. Um, you know, there are certain maximums uh, that you can bet that are pretty low, so you can't go. Uh, you don't see a lot of high rollers at these places, but and Rockingham Racetrack is gone now, right? It is. Yeah, is it's it going to be developed. Down or yeah, is it, it's yeah, all gone. It's a big private uh, development that's going to go in there, residential and Man. some commercial. I, I don't know, Chris. It just really irritates me to see this stuff happen like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I hope before I depart from this world, I'll see a passenger train in Concord, but I don't. I don't hold much hope up for that. Yeah. You know, they want to expand 93. Mm -hmm. How in the heck are you going to do it through Concord? Yeah. Like, hello, between exit 13 and, and 16, it's kind of impossible a little bit. Well, it's, it's not impossible. But, um, you know, that's that's one of the my top priorities anyway as we reopen the state's 10-year transportation uh, planning process, mm -hmm. which we'll be getting into this summer and this fall. We'll be having hearings around the state on this. Um, that is a project that's funded with toll revenue. Mm. Um, so while you know the gas tax was increased yeah. 4.2 cents a few yeah. years back, yeah. which I think was a good move because that funded mm. the expansion of the southern portion of 93 from Salem to Manchester. Yeah. Um, this section of 93 from both through Concord um, remains unfunded, uh, that project. So mm. uh, that's a little bit further out on the horizon than I would like to see it. So I'm hoping we can try to move that one up. But you know, it's a bottleneck here. Oh yeah, um, yes, it is. You know, in the morning and certainly at about four to five o'clock every day. Yeah, um, you know, Fridays. it's backed up in both directions. Especially on Friday nights. Yes. Now coming summer, even worse. Yeah. So there, there's an implication for our tourist industry as well. Um, getting that project done would be good for the quality of life here, but also good for our economy and the people yeah. that want to go up north to ski and go to the lake in the summer. Now there's opiate stuff that's still on that. That's been there for years, the drugs and everything yeah. else. Yeah, well, you know, and it's it's an ever-changing situation. Um, and we're getting a little bit better in terms of uh, the supports we have out there mm -hmm. in our communities. Uh, but there's still so much more to do. And it's, oh, it takes a sustained effort over time. Yeah. And when we think we've got, you know, heroin um, attacked and we know how to confront it, Mm. Uh, then all of a sudden it's fentanyl. Um, oh, I know. And, yeah. um, you know, when we, you know, reach, when we get a handle on the fentanyl situation, there's going to be another um, substance that's being pushed oh, yeah. on the residents of New yeah. Hampshire. So we've got to remain vigilant and we've got to understand that this is a long term crisis, um, the crisis of addiction, that it's not just about one substance. Um, it's about, you know, how we make sure people, uh, you know, can lead healthy lives and have the supports that they need. So on your, you meet every Wednesday? 
We meet on Wednesdays, okay. um, usually every other Wednesday. Every other Wednesday, okay. Uh, where we have a formal meeting where we'll take up anywhere from a few dozen to a few hundred items. Really? Um, and, you know, our agendas can be about 10,000 pages oh uh, at some of these meetings. So there's a lot of material to get through. It's pretty dense stuff, but it's really significant um, material. So, you know, you've got to be on your toes. You've got to know what to look for, what questions to ask. Um, it's also important in our you know, council meetings um, to listen um, as much as it is to talk and ask questions. So mm. I learn a lot from the people with whom I serve. Um, I might not agree with them in terms of politics all the time, but yeah. most of what we do isn't political. So we can have a discussion about what's best for the state in terms of how to spend money or who to hire for a position. Yeah. Um, and we can typically be working in the same direction. What's going to happen, do you think, with the, with the Bow Power Plant and all that stuff? That's in your district. Yeah, energy is a, a complicated situation for us. I mean, I know the town of Bow is like, what's yeah. going to happen? Well, it's a big piece of their tax base. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, the legislature and, and we in state government have to continue to reckon with is, um, you know, there are many ways in which we push off obligations to mm. local communities, but there are ways that the state can can help. Um, you know, I think the kindergarten um, you yeah. know, legislation that's being debated, whether or not it's going to be part of the state budget, is important to make sure that, you know, there's some revenue and, and some funding that goes down to these local communities, mm. the ones that already provide it, uh, but also provide an incentive to some others that could do it, too. So that would be really important for a lot of the towns that I represent. So. I've, Hope there are other ways that you know the state can, um, you know, help cities and towns. Hmm. Um, you know, not just those that find themselves in a situation where they're losing a major taxpayer. Um, but I think for too long the state has um, downshifted costs to municipalities, and I think, um, especially in these economic times when revenues are fairly strong at the state level, uh, we can do a lot better. Hmm. Because I know that they. Uh they're talking about maybe was it they put out bids to take that site over with and, and if they do what they going to will they continue power source out of there or will they just close it down yeah I mean, that, that's a that's happen? the big question right now you know is eversource um has to sell off its uh generation assets its power generation assets um what the future of that looks like i'm i'm not certain right now <sighs> Um, but yeah, a lot of people are, are looking closely at that. Hmm. Obviously, we need more energy in our state. Yeah. We, need, we need more clean energy in our state. We've got the highest electric rates, uh, you know, the highest energy costs, um, you know, in terms of the New England region hmm. uh, in the nation. Yeah. Um, that provides a disincentive to businesses to locate and grow here, hmm. um, especially given our climate. So we need to make sure that, uh, you know, we have an all of the above strategy sure. that's going to. Um, help drive costs down. Yeah, because I mean, I know it's they went and spent all that money on that big scrubber there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tear it down. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to yeah. me. But so we'll see. The future there is uncertain. I know. I know it's early for you, but the uh, political climate has already started oh boy but are we enjoying this uh you know non-presidential uh, non-election year right now i hope can, so where we can I just really get down to do. business and actually try to get some things done i hope so I, if I'm you're like me you. i was totally exhausted by the oh, last I election i was sick of it uh, i didn't bring out the best in our state or our country nope I mean, um, I certainly didn't support uh, the results of the presidential election. I didn't either. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very fearful of the direction of things. You know, you look at some of these budget cuts being pushed by, um, you know, Trump. It really devastate. It's scary, man. You know, communities. I mean, look at what it would do for, you know, job training or economic mm -hmm. development, for home fuel assistance. I mean, th these are like basic programs that people around here count on and to pull the rug out from under uh, you know New Hampshire families like that would be devastating so you know we've it's an important time to be involved um, but I don't think it's time yet for another campaign um, and, you know we'll, we'll have time for that next year all I can say is I think it's time for another Kennedy to come out of the woodwork but I know the last two years for me to try yeah. to raise money for my local projects here the Christmas parade the mm -hmm. Christmas tree lighting and yeah. all that 
that suffered because I know that a lot of that money went to these political campaigns. Mm-hmm. You know, so I we suffered. We, I mean, as it was, we had those vandals who took over those 600 bulbs mm-hmm. and smashed them up the, off the, the state house steps. Then as we took, they took the tree down, we found out why it wasn't lighting from Christmas Day to New Year's. The harness that they put in the middle of the tree so the top and the bottom hook, all the hooks together was damaged by those by the vandals. Mm-hmm. So I gotta buy another $500 harness. So before I even start this year, I'm gonna be, I'm in the hole already. Yeah. So I mean, I'm hoping that this year we can, that they won't have the excuse for the politics took their donations mm-hmm. because I know that's where it went but yeah you're right I just you know I was like gosh it's too early let's not get into that mess again that's right that's right you know and I, they, I, I don't think voters are ready to entertain that kind of discussion yet yeah and and yeah, people want to lead their lives uh, they're busy with their come families come down to help celebrate your 100th anniversary yeah yeah they, they just want things to work 100 years now and that, and that comes down to your father and you or your brother who was a gentleman on that show with you sitting at the table that was my dad so i co-own my business with my dad and my brother-in-law um so we've been in business four generations now about 100 years a little over 100 years and wow you know it's it's um i feel lucky to be able to carry that kind of tradition forward Oh, I, you are. Yeah, it's I mean, a touchstone was, for a lot of people. I mean, as a kid, I remember going there for the ice cream, obviously, when mm-hmm. we used to go to Manchester. And then Concord had a Puritan restaurant, too. Was that a franchise? Was no one? Yes, yeah, so uh, th- there was a, a, an operation up here in yes, Concord. Yes, right on, North, North Puri- right on Main Street. Street. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I'm not sure which relative ran that, but we had relatives in different parts of uh, New England that yeah. had, had outlets, basically. But you yeah. have the best food, I'm telling you. I know the guys in Concord are going to kill me, but, I don't, but you have the best food that I know of. I mean, I, you know, chicken, I just, to be honest with you, I can't grow chicken anymore. I can't. I, we used to raise them. And yeah. I used to see my father kill them and all that and all that stuff for us to have chicken uh, dinner for chicken you know or something but i just they they're very good mm-hmm. but boy i'll tell you that loves the pie and, and i'm an, i love seafood i mean the clam shrimp all that stuff but that lobster pie is it's just my favorite well, I appreciate your little your little commercial for us. But, oh, I don't uh, care. It's your hundredth <laughs> anniversary. Nice. How many restaurants are in business to stay in in yeah. hundred years? Yeah. Well, we wanted to say thank you to the people of uh, you know New Hampshire that have sustained us for the last century. So we did a free ice cream day uh, on April fifth, and we gave out about five thousand cones. I was going to say, how many cones did you? Five thousand. Did you run out of ice cream? We actually didn't run out of anything because we kind of ramped up uh, and made sure we had enough on hand to to make it through. Wow, so we, five thousand. Yeah, cones. yeah. We have two seasons in New Hampshire. We've got winter and we've got ice cream season. So we're now into ice cream season. It's getting a little bit warmer. You know, people yeah. are going out. Uh, you know, after work, it's you know a little bit more daylight. And oh yeah. So oh yeah. This is my favorite time of year. It is. I mean, although I have to say, I do enjoy September and October. This is my favorite. Well, that's still ice cream season. That, oh, yeah. It goes. You know, Somewhat, the summer and yeah. fall. Yeah. But I'm telling you about my family, uh, we've always enjoyed coming down because you, you know, sometimes we're a bigger than numbers or small, but you've always made sure that we've been taken care of and that makes me happy because we have got some handicap in there and it's hard for someone to get in there, like yeah. with a wheelchair or a scooter chair or whatever. But Well, I know the ding dong went on, off, so it means it's time to put it, close it down for another session, but I'm just so happy to have you here again Chris to come on the show and uh, great well maybe I'll be back next year when it's time for campaign season. well I hope you come back and this maybe year we can again. make some news on the show and I'll tell you what I'm gonna run for next year I but until you then can. we've you know we've got so much going on at the State House and I just really hope people can work together and yeah. keep the best interests of the people of the state at hand and this, you know uh, try to put the you know political stuff aside as much as we can yeah. I think we're capable of doing it I think the people of New Hampshire expect it. So. Oh, I do too. So let's deliver that for them, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, on behalf of, of Chris Pappas and myself, thank you for joining us today in Around Town and my super director, Ian Marks, over there. And uh, have a great day. Enjoy the nice weather. And we'll look forward to seeing you soon on Around Town. I'm Dick Patton, your host. <laughs>